We're thankful to be able to assemble together in the warmth of a building and have such good folks here here with us. We've been announcing over the past few weeks about the upcoming surgery of Sister Ann Pugh. That is tomorrow, Lord willing, the 22nd of November. And so they've been planning for that for a while, and she's got a blockage, and they can't get to it any other way than to to go in with this kind of major surgery. And all surgery is major if you're having to have it, but this one is also pretty significant. So we want to be sure that we pray for Sister Ann and her health and all those attending to her needs, and also for Denny, for all the boys and all they're going through. And, of course, Cody's diagnosis at this time is difficult as well. So we're going to have a special prayer this evening right now before we begin on their behalf, and then we'll turn things over to Ryan as we begin worship. So let's bow together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you are the God that you are. We're thankful that you listen to us, that you promise to hear us, that you do hear us, and that you bless us, that you bless us when we pray for our own lives, and that you bless us when we pray for others. We're thankful that Jesus intercedes for us. And we're thankful that we can intercede on behalf of others too. And we understand that we face difficulties and burdens that seem too heavy to bear on our own. But we're thankful that you offer to help us bear those burdens and that you allow us to bear one another's burdens. And right now we pray especially for our dear sister, Anne. We pray for her health. And we pray for her tonight as she rests in preparation uh, for this surgery tomorrow. And we pray for Denny. And we pray for all the, uh, the boys, that you'll help them, and the grandchildren, that you'll help strengthen them. And we pray that you'll give them all um, as peaceful uh, a day tomorrow as possible. We pray that the surgery will be successful. We pray that it will go smoothly. We pray for all those doctors and nurses who are assisting her that they'll be clear thinking, that they'll make the right decisions and that all will go as smoothly and as um, successfully as possible. We pray that you'll strengthen her in the recovery, uh, strengthen Denny as he takes such good care of her. We pray uh, for the rest of that family, and we especially are mindful of Cody and his diagnosis. Bless him with strength. Uh, bless him through his treatments. And we pray that you'll bless them all to, to rally together as a family. Also help us as a church to be able to, to reach out to them and help them in any way that we can throughout this time as well. We're thankful that one of the ways you, you remind us that you care for us is that you heal our diseases and that you are the great physician. And for that, we're thankful in moments like this. Bless that good family and bless us as we serve their needs. We're thankful for Jesus most of all. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. It is good to see you out this evening for our evening worship service. I do want to make mention just of a few things that are in our bulletin before we enter into service together and continue that. Uh, remember that our, um, our midweek Bible study will be on the 23rd this week on that Tuesday instead of Wednesday. So be sure uh, to be mindful of that as we come together midweek to study together. Also on the 5th, uh, December the 5th, that is when we'll have our holiday lunch together following our morning worship service. Um, so be planning for that as well and uh, then we'll have our evening service to follow that can you remember all those who are on our prayer list as as we have mentioned and we just had the opportunity to pray for sister Ann Pew we continue to remember her in our prayers together also the McCamey family as well in our prayers uh, can, we're thankful that uh, brother Danny is able to be with us again tonight we continue to remember him and pray for him uh, also for Ronnie Molinax we mentioned this morning uh, Sister Rhonda Smith, who'd been diagnosed with cancer, continue to pray for her. I know that she would appreciate that. Uh, continue to be mindful of Cody Pugh as he begins his treatment soon, uh, as he, he has begun his battle with cancer as well. Uh, also be uh, mindful of Sonia Harris, Joey's cousin, who is uh, improving, had, had COVID pneumonia, still improving from that. Uh, we continue to want to uh, remember Tay Phillips in our prayers as well. Uh, this is the cousin of Leslie Ernest, um, having shoulder surgery. so. Be mindful of Tay in your prayers also, and as well the families who have lost loved ones, uh, Nell Studdard's family, Jim Brown, and Sawyer Mullins' family at this time. At this time, I'll turn it over uh, to Brother Ed Ernest, who will have our singing. Brother Daniel Wires will word our opening prayer, 
in the close uh, this evening, Brother Jonathan Applink will dismiss us in prayer. Sing two songs before we have our opening prayer. And the first song is, We Will Follow Jesus 994, 994, first and fourth verse. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right? Holding up his banner in the thickest fight. Listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love, leading others to him, lifting prayers above? Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see. On our side forever will the Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Next song is 832. 832, oh, they tell me I'll go home. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an uncloudy sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives their sorrows away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again. In that lovely land of uncloudy day, oh, the land of cloudless day, oh, the land of an uncloudy sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Then we have an opening prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time thanking you so much for this day that you have given us to come out and worship you. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus and his institution of the church, the forgiveness of our sins, the, the congregation that allows us to come together to worship you today. Father, we're so thankful for the avenue of prayer that you give us, the avenue of prayer which allows us to come to you with thanksgiving, to come to you when we feel sorrowful, and to come to you when we have requests. Father, as we have requests this evening, we pray that you be with those who have been mentioned on the prayer list. We pray a special prayer, as Joey did, for Sister Ann Pugh. We pray that you be with the Pugh family as they are taking care of her with her surgery tomorrow. Pray that she would have a, a good outcome. Father, we're so thankful for Joey. I pray that you would be with him as he brings us the lesson tonight. We pray that we would listen with attentive ears, that we would learn something that we can carry to the communities around us and be a good example of your love toward them. 
Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. We thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And the invitation song is 856, 856. And if you wish to, we will stand and sing this song before Brother George brings our lesson to us. Beyond this land of pardon, losing and leaving, far beyond the law, sit dark and this, and far beyond the taking and the bereaving, Lies a summer land of bliss, land beyond, so fair and bright, land beyond, where is no night, summer land, God is its light, oh, happy summer land of bliss. Beyond this land of waiting, seeking and siding, far beyond the sorrows, dark and this, and far beyond the pain and sickness and dying, lies the summer land of bliss, land beyond so fair and bright. Land beyond, where is no night? Summer land, God is this light. Oh, happy summer land of bliss. Be seated, please. That's all right with you guys. We'll get uh, new batteries in that by Wednesday. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in just a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to start out with tonight. The space shuttle orbiter named Columbia was the first of five shuttles that entered space. It made its first flight in April of 1981. It ran... 22 years in operation in 28 different missions. It spent over 300 days in space. It completed over 4,000 orbits around the Earth. It was on February 1st, 2003. You may remember the destruction, the explosion of the space shuttle Columbia. Of course, killed all seven crew members on board. And it was destroyed upon its re-entry because of a failure to its thermal protection system. So when they investigated, the most probable cause was that when they launched, a piece of debris punctured some of these tiles on the outside of the shuttle, and especially on the left wing, and that allowed hot gases when they re-entered to enter the wing and it exploded the entire vehicle. These space shuttles depend on these heat-absorbing tiles. There are about 24,000 on those old space shuttles, about 24,000 six-by-six blocks of tile. And they're basically made of silica or sand that's produced, um, and they are excellent insulators. Those are exposed up to 2,300 degrees upon reentry, and they bring the temperature down to about 350 degrees at the skin of the orbiter. So what's happening there is that the occupants of that vessel and really the vessel itself are not in and of themselves made of material strong enough to handle that heat on their own. But they put something in between themselves and the source of the heat that is strong enough for, to endure and deflect that heat. So when we find ourselves having confidence that's shaken, we might question our faithfulness to Christ, those kinds of things. We might have it attacked. 
where then do we turn to a source that's in between us and that distress, us and the attack? What can absorb the pressure and the heat when we face those moments of distress? The churches or the church in Thessalonica were anxious. They were anxious largely about the return of Christ. They're already beginning to endure some persecution to face that. And they have some gaps in their understanding and their confidence about Christ's return. And it's no surprise that this increasing persecution is accompanied by some increasing anxieties. We might do well just to see that as things are shifting and changing culturally about how Christians are treated and viewed, that's naturally going to increase anxiousness within us. Probably a helpful lesson for us to pause and remember. But in First and Second Thessalonians both, when Paul does is he not only corrects their, their misunderstanding to a degree about the return of Christ, but he also always points them back to what they had already heard. He doesn't write for the sake of telling them all this new information, but he writes to tell them what you've already obeyed, what you've already heard from us, is enough. It is what you need. So we talked about this passage last week, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. Shaken in mind or alarmed. There it is, that anxiousness, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. He understands that they're beginning to be anxious. They've, they're thinking, well, maybe we've missed Jesus. And so he goes on and he tells them some things that they need to remember. You've already heard this would not happen until other things have happened. But then when he closes the explanation near the end of the chapter, look at verse 13. We didn't read this one last week, but notice what he says in verse 13 of chapter 2. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit, and notice, and belief in the truth. Where's your salvation coming from? It's coming from God, but it's coming from the truth. He's revealed it to you so that you can obey it to be saved. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, here's the command now, stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us either by our spoken word or by our letter so their traditions pointing them to the the pattern of what's been taught that they had already heard from these apostles or from paul and his companions verse 16 now may our lord jesus christ himself and god our father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word so it's possible for you to maintain your confidence and stand firm, even in light of these events that could cause distress. Where will you find it? By going back to what you had already heard, what we had given to you, what we preached to you, what we wrote to you, to instruct you, to bring you to salvation in Christ, but also to find your stability moving forward. And this is because when they did obey, they understood what they were obeying. That's what he made clear in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Because they knew what they had been taught, both about the salvation of Jesus Christ, but also the things Paul had revealed about his future return, Paul reminds them, because you know this is from God, you must and you always can keep going back to it. And we need a constant reminder that how we view the Bible as whether or not it really is, what it really is, his very word, that is a key attitude, maybe the key attitude that makes the difference in our obedience. So let's take a moment and examine Jesus' perspective. How did Jesus view scripture? How did he view the Bible as the word of God? And how does that then connect to our obedience, this attitude towards Scripture, toward the Bible as the very Word of God? How does that influence our obedience to it? To Matthew chapter 5, we'll turn. Matthew 5, verse 17. 
You remember that the sermon opens with Jesus highlighting these qualities, these attitudes of those who are blessed. Those are the people who will be blessed in his kingdom. And then he pivots after that and points to the difference-making nature of those followers of his. Be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And then listen to what he says in verse 17. We might take for granted why he includes this. But you remember that as him who's coming with this new message, a new covenant, he's correcting the religious leaders of the day. But notice why he's correcting them. It's not because he's destroying the law, but instead because he's honoring it and even fulfilling it. So verse 17 of Matthew 5, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Be kind of our first idea, what's Jesus' attitude towards Scripture? And our second main idea will come from 19 and 20. Listen to these two verses. This is how it then carries us into obedience, following him more closely. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's not a compliment. That's saying you'll miss the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you see that directly leads the attitude of understanding how precious every single character and every single part of the character of the word of God impacts whether or not we relax it or we teach it accurately. And that then reflects whether or not we are righteous after the likeness of God and thus more righteous than the religious leaders of that day. So let's break these two ideas down. How did Jesus view the written word of God? How did he view the written word of God, the first two verses, 17 and 18? He's correcting their assumptions. They automatically thought, well, this guy's got new things. He's kind of challenging us. That means he doesn't like our law. But Jesus is not ushering in something completely foreign to the Old Testament law. In fact, he's fulfilling it. The old is not worthy of being destroyed. It is passing away with its effectiveness, with its means of being the saving path to God. He's completing the old, not destroying the old. The written law, the prophets served a valuable, necessary purpose in the plan of God to bring Christ into the world. The word for fulfilled here in verse 17 is used at times when the apostles were fishing. Their nets were filled, fulfilled. And so when Jesus comes into the world, there are these prophecies. And there's this overall will of God to save man. And by the way Jesus lived and carried out his gospel, he fills that net. He's bringing it to its completion. It had not, not yet been fulfilled. And that's why Jesus came. So his purpose and his view of scripture was high because I came to fulfill it, not to destroy it. So in one aspect, he fulfills the messianic prophecies about the Messiah. There are a list of, of hundreds of these prophecies about the Messiah to come. Well, Jesus fulfills them. And you know, the Jews had a, a list of expectations they had from the Old Testament about who this Messiah would be, what he would look like, and how he would lead. Well, Jesus fulfilled those. There are plenty of others that they did not know at the time were prophecies about him. Those two he fulfilled. Listen to how he preaches this about himself. Luke chapter 24, he's walking with those disciples earlier. Then he meets with the, um, all the disciples following that. Luke 24 verse 44. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Did you catch those three sections? The law of Moses the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus says the whole Old Testament has been pointing to me the entire time, and it must be fulfilled. So verse 45, then he opened his mouth, their minds, excuse me, their minds, to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
It's this fact that he fulfills the entire Old Testament law that then points to him being the means by which forgiveness and salvation can be proclaimed. But he also shows there in Matthew chapter 5, our original text, about how this fulfillment of the law relates to the law itself, not just the messianic prophecies, but also the fulfillment of the law itself. He's ushering in a covenant and a kingdom that will be called the law of Christ, but it is on a different plane from the law of Moses in that it directly addresses the heart. It's a covenant that's given on the basis of love. Jesus would tell those critics of his, when they would ask, what's the one great commandment? He would say, it's to love. They missed that about the law. Well, he comes and he shows this is a heart-based law and covenant. And he fulfills what was prophesied about that in the Old Testament. It's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. It's not external only, but instead an internal changing of the heart that leads to change of behavior. I will be their God. They shall be my people. You look back at the ministry of Jesus and you see the importance of how the written word of God factored into his ministry. It's eye-opening just to see how guided he was by all these things. Even before you see him appearing on the scene, you see two people who, quote, seek to find Jesus based on what they found written in the scriptures, Herod had evil motives for finding him. But where did Herod turn to see where he could find Jesus? He went to the Old Testament scriptures. He had his teachers look it up in the law. Where, where's this Messiah going to be born? They figured out Bethlehem. When Philip goes to Nathaniel, he says, We have found the Messiah that was promised in the scriptures. So where do we go to find Jesus himself? It's in the writing the word of God that we find our savior. But then Jesus himself, when he was tempted, tempted to prove he was the son of God. That's key here. He actually proves he is the son of God by resisting the devil's temptations. He proves he's the son of God by exercising proper handling of the scriptures, by knowing them, by living them, not by merely using them to achieve his own ends, but instead to defend against temptation. Then in Luke chapter 4, Jesus would get up in Nazareth and he would read from the scroll of Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as he sits down, all the attention is upon him. He began to say to them, verse 21, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He understood the purpose from which he came. Isn't that powerful? To be able to say, this is why I came, and to quote written scripture as one's purpose. That's how highly Jesus understood scripture was and viewed it and treated it. Of course, when he would explain his upcoming rejection, his crucifixion, his resurrection to his disciples, he would remind them not only that it was going to happen, but he would remind them it's been written already that it must happen. So Luke 18, for instance, verse 31, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the son of man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over the Gentiles, will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. That's some amazing detail, isn't it? It's because... He knew it, so because it was written, they could go back and check. Verse 33, after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise. This is the same reason that when Paul would explain the gospel in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 15, he could say, according to the scriptures. This is what has been promised and recorded all along. So, we go back to Matthew 5, just quickly for this transition to the second idea. He says that until heaven and earth pass away and until all is accomplished at the end of verse 18, until that day, not an iota, not a dot will pass 
from the law. Every character and every little line. See, a Yoda is probably the kind of translation of the Greek letter Yod, the smallest Greek letter or Hebrew letter. The tittle is just a little bitty hanging off piece that separates letters from each other. He says it's all going to be preserved. So think about that for a moment. How precious is the word of God? So precious that every single piece of a letter of a character is going to be preserved. So the natural emphasis in verses 19 through 20 should follow. That it's worth preserving in our lives with our obedience because it will be preserved by the God who spoke it and inspired it. That must be our attitude, to preserve every word, to preserve every commandment. That's what he warned about in verse 19. If we relax, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. And whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven, to do and to teach. Not relax and to teach others to relax, but instead to do and to teach because it's not passing away. It's not going anywhere until all is accomplished. So true obedience, true understanding, following him in verse 19 leads to righteousness in verse 20. Because it changes our hearts, because it changes our lives from the inside out. That's why we can say we have the righteousness that comes from God. Remember how Paul opens Romans chapter 1, this emphasis on God's righteousness. And that follows a trajectory through to the end of the book even. And it's all about God's righteousness being seen in us, but coming through our obedience to the scriptures. It's Romans chapter 1, verse 1. A Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures, concerning his son. Verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And in the very close of the book, to book in this entire majestic book of Romans, listen to how he closes, verse 25 in Romans 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, there it is, the revealed gospel, the good news, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, and through the prophet, prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. So why has all this been written? Why has all this been preserved and going to remain preserved so that we can obey it? Obey it for salvation and obey it for constant strengthening, standing firm in the Lord. These religious leaders that Jesus is talking to and about in in, uh, Matthew chapter 5, they knew the individual laws backward and forward, but they did not comprehend or live by the fact that it was love beneath it all to love God, to love man. So all of this comes to a head when we think about the righteousness exceeding the scribes and the Pharisees. That's possible because we understand that love is the pillar upon which all the rest of our obedience hinges. Galatians 5, Paul emphasizes this, verse 6. It's in Christ Jesus that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. And then verse 14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus, supreme, high view of scripture. To know that he's not coming to destroy it, but instead to fulfill it, to usher in the new covenant where we don't depend on the old for salvation, for rightness with God, but we do still preserve it. That attitude is what fuels us to be able to obey him and to submit to him in all things and live with righteousness that comes from God and not an attempt to live with righteousness that comes from our own efforts. Quickly, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. If we were to look at a single verse that reminds us what's an attitude that's helpful about the word of God, about the Bible being the word of God. Well, 2 Timothy 2.15 is one of those verses near the top of that list. 
We're not going to necessarily break down that verse, but we want to notice two dangers that surround that verse. So look at verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins hearers. Verse 15, do your best. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So the King James went with study to open verse 15. It's kind of changed. The English language has changed over the centuries. The word there that's in the Greek is the idea of committing to excellence and doing your absolute best with diligence in all things, not just studying, but in all things. But of course, the end clause is the, the magic phrase. If we're going to be approved before God, if we're going to worry about him most, we have no reason to stand ashamed. It's going to involve and demand rightly handling the word of God, the word of truth. So verse 14, we just read, not to quarrel about words. Look at verse 16, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. green. So while the emphasis is on verse 15, for our purposes tonight, notice the two dangers of verses 14 and 16. Number one, the danger of not quarreling about words, the danger of quarreling about words. The expectation that we should be above and beyond quarreling about insignificant things. Quarreling is what those religious leaders of Jesus' day were doing, were they not? That he was having to correct, they loved to quarrel and fight and make judgments and draw lines based on where you took a stand on certain issues. They automatically assumed they were correct, and thus they picked fights with anyone who was different. You know, it doesn't matter which side someone's on, if it's to the left or the right, but those who are not fully in love with the God of the Scriptures naturally seem drawn to quarreling and disputing. Is this about God or is this about me? must be our primary and first question. But notice in the text of verse 14, the consequences of the quarreling. It doesn't accomplish any good. See, Jesus' attitude, Jesus' purpose was to come to fulfill the word. But this perspective, this attitude does no good. It accomplishes nothing and it ruins those who hear the quarreling. Listen to the Greek word. That's the word for ruin here in 2 Timothy 2 verse 14 catastrophe catastrophe strophe catastrophe it's the greek word that would morph into our english word catastrophe is the word for ruins here in second timothy chapter 2 and verse 14 the only other time that it's used in the new testament is in second peter chapter 2 in reference to the destruction of sodom and gomorrah quarreling seems to be helpful at times it's deceptive in that way though Paul reminds Timothy it's not helpful. In fact, it leads to destruction. It's not just ill-advised. It's not just unwise and foolish. It's destructive to quarrel. Instead, honor the very letters of God's holy word. But number two, verse 16 of 2 Timothy 2, avoid irreverent babble. We must avoid um, saying things that maybe sound good, even about God and about his word but that are ultimately still disrespectful to his character and his nature. The root word here for Babel has to do with empty. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't fill anything. The word of God should fill our lives when we realize and remember it is straight from him. But irreverent Babel, irreverent emptiness will never accomplish that. Notice its result, verse 16, in light especially of Jesus commands in Matthew chapter 5, it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And it will spread like gangrene. It will spread like this horrible infection that once it enters and once it takes root, causes the loss of limb, if not the loss of life. Honoring the true word of God, in contrast, leads to more righteousness. When you have this highest possible view of the word of God, that's where we can then pursue God through his word to live with righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees who mistreated others. But to get caught up in these quarrelings or these irreverent babbles 
leads to ungodliness. True righteousness has the capacity to spread just like unrighteousness if we will commit to living it from the very word of God. So the more we grow comfortable with the word of God, the more we may have to remind ourselves of this temptation instead of just viewing it as another book, instead of viewing it as something that's convenient that we can always have nearby, we must keep going back to it with the supreme, reverent, and sacred attitude of remembering what it really is, the word of God. And that attitude makes all the difference when it comes to our obedience and keeping it. Tonight, if you need to keep it, if you need to obey it, in order to receive the salvation, the gift of salvation he offers. Please know this time is for you. Would you obey him tonight and put him on in baptism? We'd love to see you and help you make that decision. If you are a Christian, but you know that you've not been living up to the, the standard of Christ's life and Christ's gospel and the very words of God, you can make your life right with him tonight as well. We'd love to help you and, and assist you and walk with you and love you and pray with you together tonight. Please know this time is for you. Please come if we can help as we sing. standing one moment. If you, need, if you need to complete your worship by partaking of the Lord's Supper, by giving, you can exit down to the hallway and go with James to the supply room. He'll be happy to assist you there with the completion of those. Thank you again so much for your presence tonight, for your encouragement, for singing out, and we look forward to being together this week again on Tuesday evening. Tuesday evening, six o'clock, for our Bible study. Our James books have not yet arrived, but maybe, Lord willing, they will tomorrow or Tuesday. And if you need one of those, maybe we'll have those on hand Tuesday night. Nothing else? We'll sing one more song before we close in prayer. To God in heaven, we come to you thanking you for this day, this time we've had to spend together in worshiping you. And we follow, we pray that everything we've done today has been acceptable to you. And as we go our separate ways, we continue to, to shine your light and to apply the things that we've learned and we know that are true of Christians and that we live the Christian life that we're expected to be. And please be with all of us this week as we travel, help keep everyone safe, and bring us back to the next point in time. Jesus, we pray. Amen.